Oh, Zefa Tzalo Fatu, Ele Peya, Malu Malu, Fila Neyaso. Tzalo for love of Faith City family, to all our online viewers, welcome. No my hide in my, you're welcome in this place. We want to welcome you in the name of Jesus. Um, if you missed last week, um, we started our online Zoom prayer meetings at 8 p.m. on Tuesdays. If you want to find out more information about that, please contact the church office. The email is below. But during that prayer meeting, just, just the Tuesday past, Jill shared that Jesus, would you be our treasure? And for me, it really struck a chord. And, and our very own Annie's written a song called My Reward. And I just thought, what a better way to respond to that word from prayer meeting is for us to sing that song. So be blessed. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you for who you are. We thank you, God, you're the same today, tomorrow, and forever, God. And we honor you in this place. Would Jesus be glorified? Would Jesus be lifted high? And all the saints said, Amen. Bless you, family. God, you're the source of my life. You're the fount that won't dry. Come fill me, fill me, oh God. You're the source of my life. You're the fount that won't dry. Come fill me, fill me. And to know you, Lord, is my reward. To seek your face, I'll stand in know of who you are. I know who you are. And to know you, Lord, is my reward. To seek your face, I'll stand in know of who you are. I know who you are. Your God, you're the source of my life. You're the fount that won't dry. Come fill me, fill me, oh God. You're the source of my life. You're the fount that won't dry. Come fill me, fill me. And to know you, Lord, is my reward. To seek your face, I'll stand in know of who you are. I know who you are. And to know you, Lord, is my reward. To seek your face, I'll stand in know of who you are. I know who you are. You are my treasure, whom I adore, my one desire, my greatest reward, my greatest reward. You are my treasure, whom I adore, my one desire, my greatest reward, my greatest reward. You are my treasure, whom I adore, my one desire, my greatest reward, my greatest reward. You are my treasure, whom I adore, my one desire, my greatest reward, my greatest reward. Who you are, I know who you are, and to know you, Lord, is my reward. To seek your face, I stand in know of who you are, I know who you
Good morning, my family and friends. What a delight it is to be with you again today to bring to you this part three of this teaching series entitled Marriage Matters. And I say to you today that marriage really matters. God's ultimate purpose in marriage was that marriage between a man and a woman would be the building block for civilization. That strong marriages would produce strong families and strong families would produce strong communities. Strong communities would produce strong cities and cities nations. And we've seen that statistically all over the world where marriages are strong, families flourish, communities flourish. God's building block for civilization. In Genesis chapter 1, as we, we've heard in the first two parts of this teaching series, we saw that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you. It's a profound passage of Scripture where we see that God creates man and woman in His image and His likeness. He brings them together and um, says that for the cause of marriage, a man will leave his mother and his father, a woman will leave her mother and father, and she will cleave to or be united to, or she will, over a process of time, the two of them will become one flesh. Two completely separate individuals becoming one, which is a lifetime process in marriage. What I love about this passage in Genesis was that God institutes marriage but yet he empowers in this passage Adam and Eve for success. He endues them with power for success in the very thing that he calls them to, which is oneness between the two of them. And uh, that's just absolutely profound. God never calls us to do anything without giving us everything we need to be successful in the very thing that he calls us to. In Genesis chapter 2 it says, For this reason, for the reason of marriage, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. In parts 1 and 2 of this teaching, and I want to encourage you to revise and go back to parts 1 and 2, and continue to watch them and learn from them. But we learned that God's ultimate purpose for marriage was firstly that the marriage would mirror God Himself. And in part one, we explored the very inner life of God Himself, this relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. And so we, we saw in part one that God's ultimate purpose for marriage was that a marriage between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, would begin to reflect the very inner life of God Himself. And this is the mystery that Paul the Apostle speaks of when he writes to the church in Ephesus, and he says to them, he gives them instructions, he tells, them, tells a husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church. He instructs a wife to be submissive to her husband in all things, something that is very misunderstood today in today's self-centered PC culture. And then Paul goes on to say that the oneness between a husband and wife is a mystery. And it is a mystery. It's a God mystery to be discovered in the outworking of a lifetime of marriage. But this mystery of oneness, where, where two become one between a man and a woman, Paul says that that marriage is a mystery. And then he switches tack and he says, but I'm not speaking about the marriage. I'm speaking about the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. And so, my friends, the ultimate purpose of marriage is that marriage would be a reflection to the children of that marriage 
to the community within which that marriage finds itself, and to the whole world that a marriage, each and every marriage, would be a reflection of God Himself. So in actual fact, when people look at us as disciples of Jesus who are married to one another, when people look at us, when our children look at us, they see living examples of what the life of God is really like by seeing mom and dad, how they love one another, how they are united and becoming more and more united in all things in life, how they resolve their differences, how they offer this profound gift of self. And, and I shared with you in part two that it's impossible to experience love and it's impossible to experience oneness in marriage or even in life without taking a hold of one of the deepest principles of the kingdom of God, which is the principle of self-surrender. And that's one of the profound keys to success in every single marriage, not just in marriage, but in life. And that is the principle of self-surrender. Another purpose of marriage is, uh, as we saw in, the, in, in parts one and two, is that marriage is also purposed or designed for companionship. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. And then God said, I will make a helper suitable for him, or a suitable companion for him. That's to live life together, to love one another, to complete one another. And uh, this is referred to as that mystery of oneness. So companionship is one of the main purposes of marriage. And thirdly, another main purpose in marriage is that marriage is God's means for multiplication, for children to be born out of that union and that that couple would leave a godly legacy. You'll remember from the book of Genesis that when God creates Adam and Eve and He calls them to oneness, He endues them with power. So as the Father, He empowers them for success. He settles their identity and He settles their destiny and empowers them. A married couple, a man and a woman, a mum and a dad, a husband and a wife are God's agents. They are God's representatives through whom God has chosen to impart to the children two things. Firstly, identity, their identity, and secondly, their destiny for life. And that is absolutely profound. And then God obviously empowers for success. And a mum and a dad, one of the purposes of marriage is not just to have children, but to empower them for success in life, to prepare them and to empower them for success. That's very, 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 very important. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says this, For this reason, or for the reason of marriage, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Now, this one fleshness does not just refer to physical intimacy, but it's a couple who are, made, are, are created spirit, soul, and body, male and female, from by design two opposite uh, complementing individuals come together in marriage and the oneness is a oneness in physical intimacy. It's a, it is a oneness emotionally, spiritually, financially. It is each spouse leaving their respective families in order to come together to establish a separate household under the authority of God and under the authority of of the husband. What I want to focus on uh, today, and we're going to uh, get some feedback and some insights from some of the pastors of our church, we're going to look at cleaving or becoming one. One Bible version speaks, uses the term cleaving. Another one speaks of being joined to. Another one speaks of, being hol of holding fast to. And this is a lifetime process of marriage. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at some practical keys from some of our pastors, uh, keys to building oneness, which entails firstly recognizing the threats to oneness, and uh, we're going to look at how to remove 
uh, these barriers to oneness in a marriage. I'm going to come back after uh, uh, some of the pastors have shared their insights and their thoughts, and I'm actually going to minister and speak into uh, the various threats to oneness, and uh, we're going to pray into these things. I'm going to first uh, just address uh, Jim and Jill. Jim and Jill are pastors at Faith City. They've been pastors at Faith City for the past eight years. They've been married for 47 years, and they're going to share some of their insights on some of the threats to oneness and um, also some of the um, key purposes of marriage as well. Jim and Jill. Thank you, Michael. Jill and I have been married now for 47 years. And on our marriage day in a small farm community Anglican church, we said to each other, I, James, take you, Jill, to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death us do part according to God's holy law, in the presence of God, I make this vow. And then right after that, in Mark 10, 9, it was quoted, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. That's it. Joined together forever, at least in our life here on earth. This is God's ideal for marriage because it reflects the love relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, which is filled with perpetual joy because of the constant self-giving and receiving that takes place within God's own nature. From that love nature, God created man and woman as lovers who were made to give and receive love just as God himself does. Shared marital love looks a bit like this. Each finger represents her individual traits. On my hand, my fingers represent my individual traits. We merge and become one. We're still individuals, but living as one. Body, soul, spirit, joined through all the good and bad times of life. When we think back to the beginning, to the first lovers, Adam and Eve, they did not stop becoming lovers after the fall. Created in the image of God, they could not undo that. Instead, their love turned. 2 Timothy 3.24 tells us what it turned to. And amongst other things, they became lovers of themselves, meaning that they were now selfish. The bottom line of selfishness is that it takes way more than it gives, loves self more than others. As a single, one can get away with this up to a point, but as a married couple, it is a threat to the success and happiness of the marriage, and what God intended for our shared good becomes bitter, even to the point of destroying the relationship. One of the areas in marriage where selfishness can cause the most havoc is in one's romance, probably because marriage is the only God-designed place for that to happen. Romance looks quite different in every marriage, and it is up to the couple to find expressions of romantic love that bring mutual enjoyment. I was quite happy that candlelit dinners died an early death. We both decided that we found way more enjoyment in having wild adventures white water rafting in Zimbabwe, hot air ballooning in Turkey, snorkeling in the Gulf of Oman, which has created wonderful memories and gives us much to talk about. Absolutely, yep. In all honesty, we cannot say that we've always approached married life together in mutual submission, which basically means getting on the same page together. In order to go in the same direction, but we do try to make it a very high priority. When it comes to principles, we never argue. What God has decreed in heaven goes without question. When it comes to personal preferences, we discuss 
and come to an agreement as to what direction we should be going in together. We are different, but we can still, still walk in unity. Luke chapter 6 verse 38 sums up God's action working in a marriage. Where giving is at the heart of each individual. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Bless you all. Thank you, Jim and Jill. We're next going to hear from Essendon and Sarah, who are also pastors here at Faith City Church. Uh, Essendon and Sarah have been married for 13 and a half years, and they've been pastors in this church for the past eight years, and have been a tremendous blessing to this family. Uh, Essendon and Sarah, what, what breaks down oneness in marriage, and what builds up oneness in marriage? Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, you know, a great one of the great threats in a marriage is actually is, is losing the unity and the oneness that, that marriage brings, and a good marriage and a godly designed marriage brings. And one of the, the the big challenges, I guess, that a lot of people need to to know, especially those who are new uh, to marriage or, or who aren't married yet but are looking to, is that um, you can't be naive. That uh, you're going to have times when there's disagreements and there's going to be times when there's challenges. And one of the, the things that sort of helps us through in, in, in our marriage in particular is this understanding that God's design is far greater than just one of us or our individual parts. But actually together, um, God has been able to create a, an amazing thing and a new thing according to his purpose. And so you know, if you're allowing things that come in that are actually going to cause division, you need to get in early, stop it early, and, um, and also fight fear. Um, there's nothing wrong with having disagreements. Hopefully, my wife agrees with that. But you know, these you're going to have disagreements. But also, you've got to learn to understand that um, once that time of cooling down comes and goes, you're actually going to have to repair whatever damage has been created. And and the less damage you do during the actual time of confrontation, then the less there is to have to have, sort of have a hurdle or, or hurt that you've left behind. So, in terms of oneness for us, and, and you know, Sarah will, will speak a bit in terms of. Um, I guess, life with our kids and family life. But definitely for me, in terms of God's purpose, is always understanding that God designed us to, to be together and designed us for a purpose. And, and the life we lead now is far greater than the life that um, I know I would have had if I was just by myself. And being able to, to share it and also grow in our marriage is something that um, truly you know, we, we thank God for and we know that God's behind it all. So two points I'd just like to make is that a failure to grasp and understand God's perspective together on these problems will result in isolation. The second point is that once you understand the problem, the solutions will become clear. Um, so quite early on in our marriage, I learned quite quickly, um, being married to Essendon, that silence is not the golden rule here. Um, when I did give the silence, uh, yeah, became silent because I was, I was upset with Essendon, the one thing he told me was, honey, you can be silent for as long as you like, but everything is okay on my side. You have to deal with your issues so that we can carry on with, um, you know, with the day. And I went away and I thought about it and I prayed and I thought, my God, he's right. <laughs> he's actually right. I can be sullen and I can be upset for this whole entire day and what a waste of time that will be. Or I can just deal with the issues, find out what the, where it's coming from and then pray and, and, um, ask for forgiveness, which is quite humbling um, to my husband and carry on with life. But also this sets an example to the kids um, to be able to deal with it. And our relationship is, is better for it that I've been able to, to do that. And the kids see that we do have disagreements. Uh, we, we still do um, have bumps along the road, but how we um, resolve the issue is what they will learn from and be able to carry on in their life and their relationships in the future. And uh, just finally, I think in terms of understanding, I guess, oneness is that um, in marriage is a very difficult place to learn some of these things that God actually values and, and, and calls us to. So um, you, we can learn to honour people that are in workplaces. We can learn to honour people that are in, in the marketplace. But, um, you know, it's, it's a different thing when you have to learn to honour your wife and, and vice versa and also submission. And also unity, and so it's it's a tricky situation at times. But um, we know in our thirteen years of marriage so far is that um, every time we've followed what God has called us to do—to honour, to cherish, to love, to obey, 
uh, to submit, you know, the, the fruit of that has been far greater than anything if we just tried to do it on our own. And one thing we always probably I would suggest for people who are in marriage is um, to understand that together might be sometimes go through your tough phases, but if you're alone, it's actually a lot harder than that. And if you remember what it's like to be alone, um, then you know that God's purpose in calling you into marriage is actually not just companionship, but also for God's calling and purpose for you as a couple. Uh, Corinthians, First Corinthians 11, verse 11 says that in the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. So for me, it's about giving of yourself 100%. Um, you become one when you're, when you're thinking about your spouse and that everything that you do, there's a purpose behind it for you know, the building of the kingdom. Um, and so you make decisions, you're thinking about making decisions you're always thinking about your spouse, how your, um, yeah, how that comes about. Cool. And then um, just to finally, you know, when, when Jesus said he has come to give us life and life more abundantly, you know, in our marriage, um, we find that our marriage gives us more than um, a, a, just an abundant life, particularly when kids, and it can be a challenging life at times. But um, when you deal with that as well, I mean, we wouldn't have it any other way. And I, I don't think anybody that's in a godly marriage would trade it for anything else. So bless you guys. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to hear from Paul and Monica, who have been married for 12 years and have been pastors here at Faith City for the past four years. Paul and Monica, same question to the two of you. What breaks down oneness in marriage? And what, what are some of the key things that uh, you could share with us today that actually build into, build into oneness? Hey, great. Thanks, Michael. Um, what I'd like to do first is uh, look at the aspect of threat to marriage. I think one of the things that um, really stands out for us in terms of threats to marriage is this thing that is pertaining to extramarital affairs. And uh, maybe some of you would sit back and think, oh, you know, do we, do we address that? But I think often when we talk about extramarital affairs, we, we immediately go to sexual infidelity and we think, you know, the extreme. But there are so many other elements that, uh, that actually compete for our attention in marriage. And so when we, when we talk about extramarital affairs, I, I'm really referring to those things that are searching, that we are searching for fulfillment outside of our marriage. And so just for a moment, uh, the two of us would like to just introduce three little points that, that would be important for us to, to understand. And so one of the first things is, is love affairs. You know, um, right from the onset of our, of our marriage, one of the things that that became very clear to us is that, you know, we, we had some friends of the, of the opposite sex. And uh, when we got married, we, we realized very quickly that as much as some of those friendships were actually really helpful, we had to relinquish some of those friendships for the sake of bringing security and, and just, you know, for the sake of building onto our marriage. And so I would say for us, that one of the things was that we, we had to deal with this in order to ensure that there's safety and boundaries around our, our marriage. And so for us, I think it's important that we deal with, with unhealthy, close relationships with even people that we have got friends with because we have to, in many, many ways, provide boundaries in our marriage that will protect us and protect um, our intimacy and protect our oneness in a marriage. And another way that we uh, do that is by... Uh, making sure that when we're alone at home, for example, if I'm at home alone, that um, we I don't invite another male over, vice versa. When Paul's at home alone, that there's no females that, that um, come and visit. Uh, another thing that we do is we make sure that we, uh, we share our social media, uh, for example, our Facebook. We have got a joint account, and it's just to be transparent and not in a so that it's like an uh, authorita um, authoritative way, but that we uh, we honour each other. And um, when I, for example, send a message via Messenger, and it's to a lady, that I make sure that I end off with my name, not that. The lady thinks that it's actually Paul communicating these wonderful messages with them. The next thing that we roughly want to just very quickly want to catch up on is um, the thing about career affairs. And it is such a very subtle thing that actually creeps in into our lives because often we work and we feel like, you know, we've got to work unto God and we've got to give it our very best. And, and then often what actually happens is, is that, 
you know, we, we spend so much hours working or at home working that actually what it does is it actually breaks down intimacy, uh, it breaks down closeness and affection, you know, um, in the marriage. And so for many of us, as much as the pressure is there to always work and, and work is good and we, we, we advocate working hard, but, but we can't use that as an escape uh, for our marriages or work too much that we actually end up, um, you know, having breakdown in our marriage um, because of that. And, you know, unfortunately, some of the culture that we, that we face with today is that we actually honor workaholics at the expense of family and raising children and actually building marriage. And so those are one of those things that are, that are really important for us um, as a threat that can come into our marriage. And, and many times before, I think I've said it on the pulpit, um, is that these legitimate excuses that we can, that we can justify, actually, that actually increases into our marriages. And so really just wanted to, to raise that thing for us. Maybe, love, maybe practically you can just help us to uh, create some context around it. Yes, in our first year of marriage, uh, Paul was very busy with work. I was very busy with work, and we, we almost worked past, well, um, lived past each other. And um, I think... The very first year of marriage is so important because there's so many different aspects um, that you're trying to deal with each other. You come from different cultural backgrounds, you've grown up differently, and you're just trying to work through those things. But with us, we were just in our books. We were just working, 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 and I think we could have sorted out so many things a whole lot faster by spending time together and not focusing all our attention on work. Yeah, so I think just a reminder that we, we find great balance for the sake of building good marriages. And so the next thing I really want to just uh, highlight as we end this thing about threats is um, the thing about activity affairs. It really is an interesting context because people want to break away from marriage and clear their heads and have space for themselves. But you know what actually often happens? People find themselves involved in activities that eat into really good quality time, you know, with your spouses. And so it's important that we find things that we can clear our heads and you know, blow some steam, but actually it can't be at the expense of, of our marriage, you know, because let's be honest, one day it's going to be me and this beautiful lady next to me. We're going to grow old together and that's our desire and our kids are going to be out of the home and they're going to build their own lives. And if, if we can't find ways to do things together, and that's the encouragement, is find activities that you can do together and enjoy together. Do life together. Learn how to sacrifice for the sake of enjoying some things. Monica enjoys a lot of walking. I enjoy a lot of coffee, drinking. She sacrifices a lot more than I do when it comes to walking. But one day when we're old, we want to do a lot of walking together. We want to drink a lot of coffee. But, but be careful in your marriage not to do so many activities that actually miss the special moments you know, in your marriage. And so that would be our encouragement for you is look out for these little foxes in your marriage that come in to begin to steal the fruits of building a healthy and a strong marriage for you guys. And another thing that uh, we also have been doing is creating space to um, have date nights. Paul will plan a date night and it'll be a surprise for me. I will have no clue what's happening, but he'll surprise me. We've put it in our diaries so that we don't forget about it because life gets so busy with children, with working. It just gets too busy without you putting it into your diaries. Uh, before you know it, a month has disappeared, a year has disappeared. So you need to be intentional about spending time together and keeping it exciting. So it's still romantic enough if you spend some time diarising it because before you know it, another month and another week has gone by. So just for a moment, I want to just to shift our attention to something that really excites me as a husband and the purpose of marriage, which is to, to, to multiply or to leave a godly legacy. And, you know, in the oneness of marriage, one of the greatest privileges you have is that we have children. And children is one of those ways in which we accomplish this thing of leaving a godly legacy behind. And so through our children and the way through our marriages, we display something incredibly important, which is the very heart and the nature of God, which you, Michael, have, have you know, touched on, on on many occasions. And so for us, the family dynamic, our marriage dynamic is the training center for training our children so that they can leave a legacy for their children and their children's children. You know, and Proverbs says this, it says, dedicate your children to God and point them in the way that they should go and the values that they learn from you um, will, be, will be there for life. 
And so we need to intentionally pass on a legacy consistent with what we believe and the things that we value. And can I say oneness and unity and harmony of marriage is important, as Michael said, because it reflects something of the mystery and the very heart of God in what we are doing. And so what we want to do just for a moment before I hand over to Monica is I want to just give us a couple of practical handles on the way in which we as a couple have found uh, helpful for us to display something of the very heart of God to our children so that when they look at us, they can see something of the intention and the heart of God in what we are doing. Sorry. <laughs> um, something that uh, we need to focus on is being a team, working as a team. Um, I found that often our girls will try and get away with something. They'll come and ask mom something. And if they don't get the answer they want, they'll go and ask dad and see if they can get the response that they are looking for. And it's so important as... Uh, a marriage um, couple to focus on working as a team, standing by, by each other's side and standing up for each other. We work as a team. We are one together. We are strong together. One of the other things I think that's quite important is that through the way in which we speak to one another is that we always speak with love. Um, despite the fact that we can disagree in life and have arguments and we, we are still on the same team. We still love each other. And every time we speak, we need to season our words with grace. And, and our children look at that and they learn from us in the way in which we, which we live our lives. And so I think one of the other things that is important um, in this thing for our children and the legacy we leave is that one thing is that we need to learn how to show affection publicly for our children, to see what it's like for mom and dad to love each other, you know, to hold and give each other a, a, a hug and hold our hands and you know, kiss each other from time to time um, without feeling awkward, but actually knowing that we're reflecting something of the heart of God and our love for one another, which is actually the very thing that, is, that has brought us together. So just as we, as we wrap up, I think something that, that I think might be really important for, for you to know is that maybe you're listening to some of this and you're wondering how, how this is possible. The reality is this, is that, that we can look at Scripture and we can look at the heart of God towards us. And in that place, the way in which we conduct and the way in which we set ourselves aside and lay down our lives so that we can build strong marriages through our kids, we can, we can learn and leave a legacy for them that when they look at how we conduct ourselves, the way we uh, play our role as mum and as dad, as the protector and the one who, who gladly serves the purposes of God alongside each other, is in that place we leave a legacy for them to look up to it and say, actually, we want that in our lives. And so when they look at our marriages, they can say, we want our children, our children's children to, to be in that place. So irrespective of where you're from, irrespective of your background, if your parents are divorced, if you grew up in a single home, surround yourself with people that you can learn and grow in so that in all of these things that we can, we can aim and walk to this wonderful, incredible sense that there's this oneness with God as we work out this incredible mystery of marriage. So that's just us in a nutshell, and I really trust that you've been blessed. Thank you, Paul and Monica. I know that uh, many of you have been stirred, you've been challenged, you've been encouraged, you've been convicted this morning. I know that um, sometimes when, uh, in fact, mostly when the Word of God is preached, things get stirred up in our hearts. And that's a good thing. Jesus said, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In life, as disciples of Jesus, we can never have a power encounter until we've had a truth encounter. It's the truth that sets us free. And I know that uh, there are married couples who've listened to this and perhaps there's some pain, pain in the heart and things have been stirred up. And that's good. That's a working of the Holy Spirit to highlight and identify areas in our lives where uh, unknown to us or perhaps even known to us, uh, known to us, there have been some threats to the oneness in our marriage. And, uh, you know, God's purpose and design is that, uh, that, that married couples would enjoy life and enjoy the fullness of life. Jesus came to give us life to give and to give it abundantly and to the full. And so when you hear a teaching or a preaching that stirs up emotions within your heart, just recognize that the Holy Spirit through the Word of God is allowing things to be pointed out in your life, not for the purposes of harm, but for the purpose of revealing areas where the Spirit of God wants to come in and bring healing and bring wholeness and uh, bring adjustments. And uh, there is a, a process that we follow here at Faith City Church of bringing healing uh, 
to people. And these are keys I want to share with you today. Uh, bef- before I pray for you at the end, um, I'm going to p- give you some homework as married couples, even for individuals who have been watching this teaching over the last uh, today and over the last few weeks. I want to give you some practical keys and handles to bringing a breakthrough in your own lives. It's absolutely vital that each and, each and every one of you learn to take responsibility for your own walk with God. The healing process, far too often people want a quick prayer. We call it the zap, the quick laying on of hands in a church service or a, or a Christian meeting, whatever it may be, and that's all going to be okay. That's very often how it does not work. And uh, God's desire and design is that in your relationship with Him, as you walk with Him, you need to walk out your healing process together with the Holy Spirit. And so there's a series of R's that we, we follow. And the first one is this, is to recognize. The second one is to repent. The third one is to release. The fourth one is to renounce. The fifth one is to remain. And the sixth one is to rejoice. I'm going to cover each of those very briefly. And I want to encourage you, here's your homework. Get a piece of paper or your journal and write these down. It is recognize, repent, release, renounce, remain, and rejoice. Let's look at recognize for a moment. Jesus said you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I want to encourage you, encourage you that through the teaching of this marriage series, you will have recognized aspects of your own life, your own character. You would have recognized things in your own marriage that you need to put right. Areas where God wants to bring in healing. It may be uh, undue family involvement in your marriage. It may be a controlling mother-in-law or a controlling father-in-law. All the things that we've listed and shared before in parts one and two and this morning. All the things you heard from the pastors of Faith City. So the first thing is to recognize. And I want to encourage you to write down the things that you have recognized in this teaching series that have highlighted issues in your own life or in the life of your spouse or in the life of your family. Write them down. Very, very important that you write them down. The second R is to repent. Now, repentance is a decision to change. Once you recognize that there are threats to the oneness in your marriage, you've recognized uh, good things, but you've also recognized bad things. Once you've recognized these threats to to, to oneness in marriage, the, the, the important thing is to repent of them, is to take ownership of your stuff. And, um, As I said, repentance is a change of heart. It's a change of direction. Like the prodigal son, a great illustration. He was walking in one direction away from his father, squandering his inheritance until he had a revelation. He had a truth encounter. And then the power encounter came. And what happened was the, the, the prodigal son, when the truth came that he was far better off in his father's household, revelation came into his soul and he had a power encounter, and he ran home repentant and was reconciled to his father. So repentance is at its core a decision to change. It also means that you will need to sit down with your spouse or sit down with family members, but first sit down with your spouse first. Go through together the list, your independent lists from each other of the things that you have written down that you've recognized that are a hindrance to oneness and actually repent in front of your wife with each other of these things, which then leads to the third R, which is the R of release, and that's releasing forgiveness. It's important when you take ownership of your stuff, that you repent of the things that you've allowed to come into your marriage that have threatened the oneness of marriage. It's important that you release forgiveness. It's important that you ask for forgiveness. You may need to forgive your spouse. You may need to forgive your mother-in-law. You may need to give your father-in-law. You may need to give, forgive others who have worked to breaking down the oneness in your marriage. Releasing forgiveness is very, very, very important. And I want to encourage married couples, this is a key part of this process. Recognizing, 
repenting, which is a decision to change, the truth encounter comes before the power encounter, and then releasing forgiveness is a very powerful thing. It's in the releasing of forgiveness that walls actually begin to come down. And I want to ask you to, to, find, uh, um, to, to find the timing in God to do this as a married couple. Release forgiveness and ask for forgiveness in the areas where you need to do so. And it's a case of coming together in agreement and talking about these issues. The fourth thing R is to renounce. That's to renounce in word and in prayer. Now this is a comprehensive topic in and of itself. But renounce means to speak off or to break off. If there's a spirit of manipulation and control from a parent over the children who are married, or if that's a spirit that you've come, o- come under, you need to, through prayer, renounce it and break it off. You've got to renounce and break off your marriage, the schemes of the devil. And the devil has come to rob and kill and destroy. He wants to bring division into your marriage. He wants to come and bring harm into your marriage. He wants to distort the beautiful picture of marriage uh, that you've heard taught about over the last three series in this teaching series. And so renounce means to stand up. It means to be firm in spirit. It means to speak off and break off. And I want to encourage you to do that as a married couple. Reminds me of um, the series Lord of the Rings. I don't know which one it was, but there was the man, uh, the wizard Gandalf. And I remember in one scene in Lord of the Rings, there's this big dragon that wants to devour him. And he takes his staff and he slams the staff down in the ground. He looks at the dragon and he says, you shall not pass. And that's what you need to be doing when it comes to this, this, this hour of renounce. You need to renounce, break off, resist in prayer and stand together as husbands and wives in this. Marriages are under attack because they are reflections of God himself and the devil wants to distort that truth by damaging marriages. And can I just say to all the men, all the husbands, take the lead role in this. Take the lead role in this as the head of your household. It's very, very, very important. You have the authority to do so, men. You have the responsibility to do so. And uh, after you've recognized your stuff, after you have repented of your stuff, after you've released forgiveness towards your wife and your wife has uh, sought forgiveness from you, it's important you, you stand together and you wage warfare and break off these things. Even some of the generational things that have been passed down from family to family and that you see operative in your own marriage, break these things in Jesus' name. The fifth R is to remain is a beautiful passage of scripture that says this, and it's a lifestyle habit that you should be cultivating as a married couple. And it's simply this, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Live a lifestyle of learning to submit to God as a couple, submit to one another, and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then the last R, number six, is to rejoice. And I want to say to you in closing in this message before I pray for you, to every married couple and to every individual who's not married and or is preparing to be married or for the the younger generation who have watched this teaching, I want to say to all of you, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let not your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in God. God loves you. He has designed marriage. He has purposed marriage. I want to encourage all those who are not married and maybe you are uh, a number of years to go still. I want to, want to encourage you to pray for your parents. Pray for the marriages that are in your, in your family. Um, and, I, and I know that those who are not married who have learned from this teaching and will continue to learn from the teachings that are to come on marriage, it's absolutely vital that you know God's pattern and purpose for marriage. We all need to have God's revelation and understanding on this ancient path called marriage. Let me pray for each and every one of you. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father, that marriage is your idea, not man's idea. And Lord, it's become twisted and distorted. Father, the divorce rate in the church, tragically, is almost as high as the divorce rate for those who are not disciples of Jesus. 
And I'm asking, Father, together with my brothers and sisters, all those that are hearing this message, I'm asking, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would raise up a standard, a tide of righteousness in marriage, that you would bring healing and wholeness to broken marriages. Even for those listening to this message today, Lord, that have been married for many years and feel hopeless in their marriages, hope deferred makes the heart sick. I feel to bring that out in this prayer. I feel that led by the Spirit of God to address all of those that are hearing this, that are married, where hope deferred has made your heart sick. I pray over you in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for a release of God's grace, of God's healing upon you. Father, I pray into the marriages, Lord God, that have been broken for many years. Would you bring a supernatural healing as, as those uh, that have heard this teaching take these ours to heart and begin to recognize and repent and release and renounce and remain and rejoice as they become faithful in these things. I pray for a supernatural breakthrough. I pray that marriages would be healed. I pray that walls of, of hurt and, and separation would come down in Jesus' precious name. Would you bless every marriage in Jesus' name. May your joy Flood every marriage in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you all. We love you and we will see you next week.